All right, now where are we in this course? Well, remember we started out and I did something that for me is like root canal work. I explained as honestly and as patiently as I could uh, mainstream philosophy of mind. And I, as I've told you over and over to the point of screaming boredom, uh, I find it awkward because I think the whole thing is based on a series of mistakes. And the mistakes, I keep blaming Descartes, uh, but that's because I probably don't know enough Greek philosophy uh, uh, to know uh, the deeper sources of dualism. But I think the kind of dualism that we have is due to Descartes. And that has left uh, people who oppose Cartesianism essentially using his vocabulary. See, that's the real problem. It isn't. Uh, that dualism is wrong and materialism is right, but they both accept the same set of assumptions, and that's what I'm militating against. I'm trying to fight against those assumptions, but it's very hard to do that because I haven't got a neutral vocabulary in which I can fight those assumptions. If I tell you consciousness is a material biological process like digestion, that sounds like I'm doing a kind of eliminative reductionism. I'm trying to say consciousness does not exist. Uh, and of course, the same sentence, consciousness is a neurobiological process like digestion, that would be used by my opponents. They say that, but they mean something totally different. I mean, take the features of consciousness they most hate. It's subjective, it's qualitative, it's touchy-feely, it's what it's like. Uh, it, un it doesn't understand anything in the Chinese room. I mean, pick all the things they most hate about my conception of consciousness, and I want to say those are both real, and they're as real as digestion. And there's something slightly crazy about these guys consciously denying the existence of consciousness, uh, but in any case, they do, and uh, you can... Um, there is an, another odd feature to this whole discussion that I should mention in passing. Uh, much of my professional life was spent doing the philosophy of language. A and in a way, that's a lot of fun because it's conducted at a very high level. And though I disagree with mainstream philosophy of language, uh, the whole thing is very high level uh, and uh, often technical stuff. Whereas, if you're gonna do the philosophy of mind, you gotta really get down and do mud wrestling, and it's, that's not so much fun. I read those guys attacking me in the, in the, on the Chinese room. Uh, some of those attacks, uh, I think they will be embarrassed if they read them uh, today. Uh, one guy says that that's the wrongest and most infuriating uh, article he ever read in his life, and another guy said, well, it's sophistry. What, he really thinks I believe that uh, computers are busy thinking? Uh, so it, it, they, there's a level of passion in uh, uh, philosophy of mind that you don't get when you're discussing quantified modal logic or the uh, application of uh, intentional operators in iterated modalities. I mean, those have whatever uh, good or bad features, they're kind of conducted at a rather sober high level. Um, but in any case, uh, we're still struggling with the philosophy of mind. Now I've, I've paid my dues to mainstream philosophy of language and I hope we're out of that a set of assumptions that I think in the end <clears throat> Wittgenstein was right that we will uh, get to a point where uh, we can't recover uh, the passion with which these issues were fought. We've already got to that point with the problem of life. Nobody can feel today the passion that people felt about mechanism versus vitalism. Uh, we think, sure, I mean, uh, 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 life is a matter of biochemical processes. Uh, they're pretty damn complicated, as you will find if you decide to major in molecular and cell biology, uh, but we understand them and uh, there's no, uh, 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 nobody wants to have a fist fight over those issues. Uh, but uh, we're not yet there where the mind is concerned. Now, I put that last time in a way that I think may cast some light on it. If you think about the relation uh, between consciousness or between the mind and death, uh, then what happens uh, to uh, the soul when the body dies? Well, Descartes' answer was the soul leaves the body because the body dies. 
Now, the funny thing is, that would have been unintelligible to Aristotle. He wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about. Because the reason the body dies is that the soul leaves it. Because that's what the soul is. It's the animating principle of the body. And the Aristotelian jargon, it is the form of the body. And Aristotle held a, a doctrine of substantial forms. And it was immensely influential, like for uh, over uh, 1,500 years it was immensely influential, and I can't make any sense out of it, so I'll let you struggle with it. Get on to Google and do your deep philosophical research. Now, I hold a view uh, that would be unintelligible to both Aristotle and Descartes, and that is uh, when the body dies, the soul ceases to exist. Uh, because in their sense, there isn't any such thing as a soul. Uh, there are mental states, consciousness uh, and intentionality, and I haven't told you the relation between consciousness and intentionality, but I will. Uh, and all of that comes to an end when the brain gives out. When the brain dies, you die. That's sad news, and uh, I don't know what time it is, but it's getting too close for me to feel uh, really comfortable about it. But in any case, that is uh, uh, the bad news. That's how things work. That, uh, In the same sense uh, that you're no longer going to be able to drink a lot of beer and eat a lot of pizza after the destruction of your body, you're no longer going to be able to think about philosophical problems or uh, who's going to win the NC2A tournament or whatever it is you like to uh, think about uh, once your brain is destroyed. No brain, no thinking. Uh, uh, or at least uh, so I can, uh, as far as I can tell. Now, of course, that's an empirical hypothesis on my part. It might turn out that a hundred years from now, we all gather together in heaven, or more likely the other place, and think that was pretty funny back in Berkeley a uh, uh, hundred years ago that we all thought that the soul died, uh, with uh, the soul ceased to exist with the death of the body. It might turn out that way, but don't count on it. Uh, I think it's extremely unlikely. In fact, I'm not sure anybody really believes in immortality. I know they say they do, but I, but I find it hard to imagine what they believe. And indeed, I'm not sure I want to be around for literally billions of years. I'd like a few more hundred. Uh, that would be nice. But the idea that, that I'd have billions and billions and billions, um, when people say infinity, they think that's kind of a long time. It's not. It's an infinite amount. And infinity is not just a big number, but it's a number that just keeps on going. Uh, in any case, uh, with, it, with these uh, cheerful thoughts under our belt, I'm going to uh, go back to the uh, next main part of the course, which is the theory of intentionality, how the mind works and then I'll relate it to consciousness when I get into talking about the unconscious. I think the unconscious is a more problematic notion uh, than most of us, uh, most people are prepared to uh, recognize. And then at the end of the course, we're going to talk about how all this gets applied uh, to issues like freedom of the will or the creation of society. How is it possible uh, that a bunch of human brains get together and create money, property, government, marriage, elections, universities, cocktail parties, summer vacations, doctors uh, and uh, lawyers, uh, and income tax forms. And all of those are created by minds working in cooperation. Now, I, I'm going to, one of the way to learn a subject is to learn the jargon, to learn the, uh, the terms that people use. So let me re remind you of the terms you should understand by now. You should understand the difference between a type of intentional state, such as belief or desire, and the content of the intentional state, such as the belief that it's raining or the desire to go to the movies. Type and content. You should understand the different directions of fit. And those have a solid neurobiological basis in the distinction between the motor nervous system and the sensory nervous system. You should understand the notion of conditions of satisfaction. Uh, they are absolutely uh, uh, crucial, and indeed I am claiming that the key to understanding intentionality is to think of intentional states as representations of their conditions of satisfaction. However, a whole lot more needs to be said about that, and one is we need to distinguish representations from presentations, and then the whole uh, system of intentionality only works 
as part of networks of intentional states. Intentional states don't come to us one at a time, but they come to us in complex networks. And indeed, the whole network only functions against a background of ways of behaving, capacities, dis, uh, dispositions, and general know-how that you have for coping with the world. And that's, uh, by the way, the background is the least satisfactory uh, part of my theory, and we just need to do some more work on it. Uh, I mean, all of us, uh, between now and, and uh, uh, the end of April. Uh, but I hope, to, I hope we can make some progress on it. Uh, okay, now today I'm going to use all of that apparatus. Oh, by the way, there's some, a couple other notions I haven't introduced, uh, but I should mention in passing. We're going to need the notion of collective intentionality, because not only do you have the ability uh, uh, to think and feel and desire and hope and fear and believe, but often you do it in cooperation with other people right now, we are having an, a manifestation of collective intentionality in that this is a course that uh, I am lecturing on and you're taking in the philosophy of mind. That's a case of collective intentionality where animals uh, cooperate and their uh, cooperation takes a mental form. Okay, now today we're going to go into the intentionality of human action and that's absolutely crucial. One of the uh, uh, odd features of the past hundred years uh, is that people have thought the notion of behavior was unproblematic, uh, that the mind, that was kind of mysterious, uh, but the behaviors taught people to believe that the behavior that people form, you can just see that. Well, I think it's the other way around. Uh, I think you cannot understand human behavior without seeing the mental component in human behavior. The same bodily movements will be different types of behavior depending on uh, the mental component. Uh, and I, you can see this obviously in the case of saying the same words but meaning something different or meaning nothing at all. If I say la plume de ma tante est dans le jardin de mon oncle and I'm just practicing Fren Fren French pronunciation then I've just uttered a French sentence. But if I actually say it and mean it, I might say the same words with the same pronunciation and mean uh, that uh, uh, my uh, aunt's uh, pen uh, is in the garden of my uncle, which is, I mean, it's a dumb sentence, but it's the kind of thing you're supposed to memorize. And I, I, I hope you get more exciting things to memorize if you ever take a French course. Uh, but in any case, I, that, it's a trivial example, but it shows behavior is not just bodily movement. In fact, it's never just bodily movement. Uh, what we're going to have to do is analyze the intentional component and the structure of human behavior. Now, just to make that sound even more pompous, let me say that one of the leading, maybe the leading intellectual problem, well, one of the leading intellectual problems of the present era, is why haven't the social sciences given us the kind of payoff in the study of human beings uh, that the natural sciences have given us in the study of the basic structure of reality? We have nothing in sociology or political science uh, that corresponds to what we have in physics or chemistry. Why is that? Uh, and uh, one of the uh, things that we're going to have to answer, one of the questions we're going to have to answer, well, what is the nature of human behavior and what is the nature, consequently, of the appropriate explanation of human behavior? So there's a sharp way of putting the question, and that is, well, why haven't the, the methods of the natural sciences paid off uh, in the study of politics, let's say, in the way that they have in the study of biochemistry? I mean, politics, after all, is a real phenomenon in the real world. Why don't we have laws of politics the way we have laws of physics? Well, a lot of people thought we do. I mean, Marx thought we could get laws of, of history um, uh, that would be just like the laws of physics. Uh, for reasons uh, that I'm going to explain to you in some detail, we can't. It's, we're not going to get laws of history for deep philosophical reasons, but I'm not ready to say that. 
Okay, here goes. The intentionality of human action. I, all three of you who take notes, I like to think you'll write a heading. The intentionality of human action, and then I'll give you the business. Here, are you ready? Here it goes. You might say, well, what is the nature of an intention? What's a human intention? And it looks like, well, implicitly, we've already uh, told you uh, that. Uh, belief is a representation of its conditions of satisfaction. Namely, if I believe it's raining, then that represents the state of affairs that it's raining, truly or falsely. A desire is a representation of its condition of satisfaction. And an intention is a representation of its condition of satisfaction. The only thing, the condition of satisfaction of an intention is always an action. It's always an action to be performed by the agent. Okay, now you'd think, well, that sounds pretty good. Let's try that out, and let's look and see how the performance of the action relates to the intention and see if it's the way the conditions of satisfaction relate uh, to uh, beliefs and desires. However, there are a lot of things that ought to worry us about that. First of all, why would we have a special word for the conditions of satisfaction of an intention? namely action, we don't have a special word for the condition of satisfaction of beliefs and desires. It's just uh, states of affairs that exist uh, in the world. You don't need a special word for the condition of satisfaction of beliefs. Why do we have this special vocabulary? And the vocabulary is kind of weird because you not only have actions, but you have unintentional actions, actions performed by mistake, inadvertently, on purpose, deliberately. What's going on? What is, in, in, incidentally, in philosophy, look at the functioning of the vocabulary, because it's always a clue uh, that something fishy, is, something or complex or exciting is going on if you get weird manifestations in the vocabulary. We don't have that. We don't have a vocabulary like that uh, for beliefs. Um, we don't have anything that corresponds to the distinction between intentional and unintentional actions. If you believe something, uh, then your belief is either true or false. Okay, but furthermore, and this really does seem strange, in the case of the relation of intention and action, it looks like you don't even have an action unless there's an intention in it somehow. Even unintentional actions seem to have to have some kind of an intention involved in them. So to take a famous case, uh, Oedipus uh, married his uh, girlfriend, Jocasta, and he married her, as we say, intentionally. But he also married his mother, and he married her unintentionally, but it was only one action. He, was, he had problems, but he was not a bigamist, right? I mean, it wasn't two different marriages. He married the same woman uh, in one marriage, but, but under two different descriptions, it is both intentional and unintentional. That is, he intentionally married his girlfriend, but in the same action, he unintentionally married his mother. And that got him in a lot of trouble, as you remember, you know, at Cologne. See, I won't tell you the whole ghastly story. Uh, you can read it. But, but uh, in any case, Oedipus had <clears throat> a serious problem, uh, but not because he performed two different actions, but he performed, he performed one action that satisfied two different descriptions. What are those descriptions described? So we got two puzzles about saying that an action just is the condition of satisfaction of the intention of performing. Uh, one puzzle is there's a special kind of vocabulary which you get for the relation of intention and action, which you don't get for the other cases. And secondly, it seems you don't even have an unintentional action uh, unless you have an intention, unless you have some kind of an intention. At least, I'm just saying now how things seem. This is a point of philosophy where we're struggling with our intuitions. We're going to get very sophisticated in a few minutes. But right, remember I told you, when you start off on a philosophical problem, you have to be naive. You've got to be sort of childlike. And then later on, you get smart. And I've never figured out the algorithm uh, for deciding when you stop being naive uh, and when you start being smart. But I know still, we're still at the naive step. Okay, now furthermore, there are lots of funny counterexamples to the idea uh, that the action just is the condition of satisfaction of the intention. And indeed, uh, many of those counterexamples are cases where the intention even causes the action 
But all the same, the intention isn't satisfied. And I'll give you a bunch of counterexamples. Uh, philosophers make their living uh, thinking up counterexamples like this. So I'll tell you some uh, famous counterexamples in the literature. Uh, uh, the first one is due to a uh, philosopher at Brown. Uh, he, he died not long ago. Well, I guess it was some time ago. His name is Chisholm, Rod Chisholm. And uh, Chisholm thought of the following counterexample. He doesn't. He didn't know Berkeley, but I'll, I'll, I'll give. I'll make the example about Berkeley. Uh, Bill intends to kill his uncle. Oh, by the way, there's something weird about these examples. They're always murderous. They're always homicidal. You know what would a Freudian say when philosophers think of examples? It's always about killing somebody. But anyway, here goes with a murderous example. Uh, Bill wants to kill his uncle. Uh, why? Well, he thinks he'll inherit his uncle's money when he kills his uncle. Uh, so to that end, now watch the vocabulary, he forms the intention to kill his uncle. Okay, he's driving around the Berkeley Hills uh, thinking about his intention to kill his uncle. And he comes to a really steep street where he's going downhill and it has a stoplight. It's the corner, we will say, of Cedar and Euclid, which is a steep, steep street. Uh, and he's facing downhill at the corner of Cedar and Euclid when the light turns red and he stops because of the red light. However, his thought, his intention, he's busy thinking about his intention to kill his uncle. His intention to kill his uncle makes him so nervous that his foot slips off the brake and the car rolls through the red light running over a pedestrian. And if you've ever had a philosophy course, I don't have to tell you who the pedestrian was. Uh, it was his uncle. Okay, now let's describe the case. Uh, Bill intended to kill his uncle. Uh, his intention caused him to kill his uncle, but he did not kill his uncle intentionally, right? I mean, uh, uh, he says to the court, uh, judge, it was an accident. My foot slipped off the brake. And the lawyers told me, uh, that's, that's right, he would get off, even though he had an intention to kill his uncle, and his, his intention caused him to kill his uncle. He did not kill his uncle intentionally. Bad driving, but not murder, not homicide. Uh, okay, that's one uh, counterexample. Here's another counterexample. This one is due to Donald Davidson of this university. I mean, you've read stuff by him already. Uh, and Davidson, I think, Davidson's example is much like Chisholm's. Here's how it goes. Uh, a climber is doing rock climbing in uh, Yosemite, and they're going up the face of El Capitan. And the first climber, uh, there are two climbers, the first climber uh, wishes uh, to rid himself of weight and danger. I'm quoting David. I've been skiing with Davidson. I've never been rock climbing with him. I'm not sure I want to go after this example. But anyway, here's how the example goes. Uh, uh, the first climber wishes to rid himself of weight and danger. And to that end, he forms the intention to loosen his hold on the rope. He's hanging on to this rope. His friend is on the other end of the rope, and he forms the intention to loosen his hold on the rope. Now, his intention makes him so nervous, he thinks, my God, am I really going to do that? It makes him so nervous that he drops the rope inadvertently, right? He dropped it unintentionally. His intention to loosen his hold caused him to loosen his hold, but he did not loosen his hold intentionally. Does everybody uh, see, uh, uh, see the example? I mean, there are two different cases. One is the case where he's really a tough guy, and he said, I'm going to loosen my hold. One, two, three, loss, and he lets go of it. He, he's a German-speaking murderer. Uh, at one, two, three, loss, and he releases his hold, and his uh, uh, partner uh, go, falls to his death. But in the second case, he's not like that. He's timid. He thinks, I'm going to loosen my hold. Oh, my gosh. Am I really going to loosen my hold? Oh, my gosh. Look what's happened. I've dropped the rope. Uh, that's the case where he, uh, he doesn't say loss. He says, oops. Uh, he says, oops, I seem to have dropped the rope. Okay, so now we got cases. He had the intention. The intention caused the action, but the action was not performed intentionally, and the intention was not satisfied. A third case... I uh, is due to uh, uh, Davidson's uh, student, uh, Dan Bennett. And that's Bennett, not Dennett. 
And again, another murderous example. Uh, Bennett imagines that Jones goes out uh, to kill Smith. He wants to kill Smith. Uh, and he knows that Smith goes for a walk. Uh, they were both at Stanford, so this is in the hills near Stanford. He knows that Smith goes for a walk in the hills. And he goes out in the hills, and he sees Smith, and he takes out his gun and fires at Smith. However, Jones is a lousy shot. And as Bennett says, he misses Smith by a mile. But... Unknown to any, either of them, there is a herd of wild pigs uh, running around those hills in Woodside. And guess what happens? The herd of wild pigs is stampeded by the shot, and the herd tramples poor Smith to death. Everybody gets the picture. Okay, now in that case, uh, Jones had the intention to kill Smith. His intention caused the death of Smith, but somehow or other, it doesn't seem right to say that he killed Smith intentionally. Why not? Well, intuitively, at least, things weren't exactly going according to plan. It wasn't his plan. Oh, yeah, those pigs over there, watch what's going to happen. That was not the plan. The plan was, bang, I'm going to kill Smith. And then uh, uh, Smith is indeed dead at the end of the story. Uh, but once again, the lawyers tell me, well, that would not be a case of first-degree murder. Yeah, you might I, I get him for attempted murder, uh, but the actual cause of death was not the shooting. Okay, what's going on in these cases? All right, now, remember what Bertrand Russell says. It's good to stock the mind with paradoxes, and we have some paradoxes here, cases where there is an intention to do something. The intention causes the doing of the something, but the something is not the condition of satisfaction of the intention. The intention is not satisfied, and the action was not performed intentionally in, all, in these cases. All right, now I'm going to go to work and give you a theory of the intentionality of, of uh, action. We're just going to go through the steps. Uh, let's stop for questions about what I've said about action or stuff, or that earlier stuff I said about uh, the philosophy of mind. Is everybody up with us? Any questions at this point? Uh, all his examples are in the uh, reading. I haven't read that chapter for a long time, but I, I remember it fairly well. It cost me a lot of work. It's chapter three of intentionality, and I think most of this stuff is in there. Okay, let's go to work. The first thing we need to do is make a distinction between two kinds of intention. Uh, there is the intention uh, that you have prior to the form formation of an action, and I'll call that a pri prior intention. Prior intention is a plan of action. And it's typically the result of a decision. You make a decision about what you're going to do, and that decision results in a prior intention. But there's also the intention that you have when you actually are performing the action, when you are actually doing it. And that's what I call an intention in action. We need this jargon because often, you do something intentionally where you had no prior intention to do it. You just haul off and do it. Uh, now, uh, for example, a standard case for me is ordinary conversation. In ordinary conversation, I don't plan what I'm going to say next. I just say anything that pops into my head. Uh, and uh, that gets me in a lot of trouble, but it's uh, the people who always plan what they're going to say next. You know, They're always thinking about what they're going to say next. There's a technical name for them. They're called bores. Uh, and I, uh, oh, oh, real people in real life conversation just say uh, they speak spontaneously. It's what makes conversations more fun. They, have, they speak intentionally. They do intend to say what they say, but they do not um, have a prior intention for every one of their utterances. Okay, the ordinary English for an intention in action is... Uh, trying. In the case of an intention in action, even if you didn't succeed, you did at least try. So the picture that I am uh, arguing for is that often you have 
a prior intention, and then that leads to an intention in action. Uh, and the intention in action is the intentional component of the action itself. If you succeed, then the trying succeeds. Uh, but even if you fail, you did try. So the uh, intention in action looks like it's an essential component of the action. Uh, let's go the next step then. It looks like uh, if you examine uh, well, let me give you another argument for uh, the distinction between the prior intention and the intention in action. Uh, many things you do, or at least I do, I do without a prior intention, and that's not just in, in a casual conversation. So, for example, uh, the way I do uh, I think in philosophy, I like to pace around a lot. Yeah, even when I lecture, I pace around. I'm sitting there in a chair, and I jump up and start pacing around, thinking about a philosophical problem. Now, the pacing around is done intentionally. It isn't like the peristaltic contraction of the gut. I really am walking around intentionally. But I wasn't sitting there planning, I'm going to get up any minute now and start pacing around. No, I'm busy thinking about some problem. And then I spontaneously, as we would say, I get up and pace around. So that's a case where you had the, prior, you had the intention in action without a prior intention. Okay, now then, let's go to the next step. It looks as if, if you look at uh, the intention in action, there is a causal component in the conditions of satisfaction. Uh, suppose I intend to raise my arm in 30 seconds. Uh, suppose the doctors told me it's an exercise, we want you to do it every so often, we want you to raise your arm. So I think, okay, in 30 seconds I'll raise my arm. I, then let's suppose I forget all about my intention to raise my arm, but for some totally extraneous reason, I do raise my arm. Uh, I'm sitting outdoors and somebody, I'm a, I'm a retired shortstop and somebody hits a line drive uh, and just out of habit, I reach up and grab the thing. I, 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 as a right-handed thrower, I pick, reach up with my left hand and grab the ball. Now that's a case where I performed that action intentionally, but I didn't carry out my prior intention. That is to say, the prior intention was to raise my arm. I did raise my arm, but the prior intention was not satisfied. It was not carried out because it did not cause the action, which was the rest of its conditions of satisfaction. So if you spell it out, it looks like the conditions of satisfaction of the prior intention are indeed that I perform the action, but this has to be a causal relation. The prior intention has to cause the action. And remember, the secret now of intentionality is always state what the condition of satisfaction are. So if the prior intention was to raise my arm, then the prior intention has that condition of satisfaction that I raise my arm and this prior intention causes that I raise my arm. That is, it looks like there is what you might call a causally self-reflexive feature about the structure of the prior intention, because the prior intention will only be satisfied. Can you read my dreadful handwriting? I, I, I'll read it aloud to you anyway. The, this, remember, our rule is you put the condition of satisfaction inside the parentheses. The condition of satisfaction of the parentheses are that I raise my arm and this prior intention causes that I raise my arm. You have to have a causal component as part of the conditions of satisfaction. Now, I said in the book that you're asked to read, I said that's causally self-referential. But that misled a lot of people. They think that means you've got to have somehow be referring. It's got to be a speech act of referring. Uh, I didn't mean that. I just meant that it is that the intention itself functions in the production of the conditions of satisfaction. So the specification of the intention of the condition of satisfaction has to refer to the intention itself as part of the content, as part of the content of the intention, because unless the intention functions causally, it wasn't carried out. Okay, now I'm going to show you in a minute that the intention in action 
is also causally self-reflexive. But before I do that, I want to examine a little bit further the structure of simple actions. And I'm going to argue that simple actions have two components. If, uh, a simple action is a certain conscious effort of trying and a bodily movement. There are these two separate components in simple conscious actions, such as raising your arm. And we have some interesting um, empirical proofs of that from experimental psychology. It goes back a long time. Here is an example from William James. Uh, James uh, had a, a subject. You put him in a dark room, and you anesthetize his arm. And you tell him, raise your arm. And he does something which he thinks is raising his arm. But unknown to him, you held his arm at his side. He couldn't move it. He didn't feel you holding him. He did something that felt like this, minus the kinesthetic sensation. Couldn't, he couldn't feel anything in his arm. But he thought he was uh, obeying the order, raise your arm. But actually, what actually happened was like this. He didn't see that his arm didn't go up, because it was a dark room, and the arm was anesthetized. But notice what he did was he tried to raise his arm. That is to say, he had an intention in action. And the intention in action was supposed to produce a bodily movement, but it did not produce a bodily movement. The condition of satisfaction of the intention in action was that it should cause a bodily movement, but it wasn't satisfied in this case because there was no bodily movement. Now, you can also, that's a case where you keep the intentional component, but carve off, leave out the bodily movement. There are also cases where you have the bodily movement, but you have no intention in action. And I mentioned some of those uh, before, but now they get to be theoretically important, so let me go over those. Uh, there was a neuro, uh, a bio, well, not just a neurobiologist, but actually a neurosurgeon. There was a neurologist in Montreal. I, I, I named uh, Penfield, uh, Wilder Penfield. And uh, uh, Penfield was, roughly speaking, uh, the best, best brain stabber within a thousand miles. And if you wanted something done to your brain, you got the money together and went to that guy in Montreal. I never met him. I met his, uh, his, uh, his colleague, his partner, Rasmussen, and we talked about these cases. But anyway, he, was a, 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 he, he had some funny philosophy. I am not advocating his philosophical views, uh, but you should look at his book if you're interested in this. But in any case, uh, he did perform the following kind of, of uh, operation. Uh, you have a, a patient where they've got something wrong with the brain and they open up a hole in the skull. And then uh, he would, uh, Penfield would stimulate the motor cortex with a microelectrode and he could cause the bodily movement. He could cause the patient's arm to raise. See, the patients are fully conscious during all this. You don't have to put the patient under general anesthetic to operate on the brain because there's no pain receptors in the brain. You don't feel any pain when the guy goes in and operates on your brain. So you're, the, the patient is sitting there or lying there, and Penfield opens a window in his skull and stimulates the motor cortex with a microelectrode, and the guy's arm goes up. Now, in that case, you had a bodily movement without an intention in action. You carved off, uh, you left out the intention in action and left the bodily movement. And Penfield says, whenever I've done that to a patient, I invariably ask him about it. And the patient says, uh, I didn't do that. You did it. That is, the, the patient doesn't perform the action of raising his arm, but uh, uh, Penfield raises his arm for him. Uh, and he also says something that I think must be creepy, and that is he says, I have caused a patient to vocalize. Uh, now, what must that be like? He stimulates your motor cortex, and you vocalize. 
Uh, he doesn't tell us what the patients vocalize. I doubt very much that it's the Canadian national anthem. Uh, but uh, in, in any case, it's probably, uh, uh, they're probably just uh, the, the vocal, uh, uh, the uh, motor nervous system to the vocal cords gets stimulated and the patient makes some noises. And again, the patient, they ask the patient about it and the patient says, I didn't make that noise, you pulled it out of me. Uh, I would have thought better, you pushed it out of me. But in any case, uh, this is a case where you have the bodily movement. This is the Penfield case over here. And in the William James case, you had the intention and action without the bodily movement. And I would want to say what that tells us is that in these normal cases of simple actions, like raising your arm or making a sound, the action consists of two components a certain conscious experience of the intention and action plus the bodily movement and the total action consists of these two where the bodily movement has to be caused by, I'll use an arrow to represent cause, the bodily movement has to be caused by the intention in action. Now, if that's right, then, um, again, now we have to start with these simple cases. Eventually, we'll get into uh, cases where you're starting the revolution or writing the great American novel or becoming president of the United States. But you've got to start somewhere, and I'm going to start with raising your arm or scratching your nose. And for these very simple cases, the action contains two components, an intention and action and a bodily movement. So if this is the condition of satisfaction of the prior intention, then the condition of satisfaction of the intention and action is simply that the bodily movement that my, let's take my arm uh, raises, my arm goes up, and you get the same self-referential feature or self-reflexive feature. This IA causes, this intention and action causes that my arm goes up. I'm sorry, I wrote this, so it goes up. Okay, so now those look kind of mysterious. Here we've got a reference to a whole action. That is, that I perform the action of raising my arm. And here we ha have only a reference to a bodily movement. But now we've resolved the puzzle to that when we say the action has two components. The action has an intention and action and a bodily movement where if the intention and action, uh, the, the uh, intentional content of the intention and action is such that it has to function causally in producing the bodily movement. So the picture then of a premeditated action is in fact fairly elegant. It looks like this. In the case of a premeditated action, you have a prior intention and if that's satisfied, that has to cause a whole action. But the action consists of two components, an intention and action, which has to cause a bodily movement. These arrows represent cause throughout. The prior intention causes the action. The action contains two components, a bodily movement and intention and action. And both the prior intention and the intention and action are causally self-reflexive in their conditions of satisfaction. In each case, the uh, intention is only satisfied if it functions causally in producing the rest of the conditions of satisfaction. Now, I think that's a beautiful structure, but we still have to go to work on it because we have to figure out how does it work for complex actions? How does it work when you're doing something that's very complicated? I, and how does it relate to other things like perception and memory? So we'll get there, one step at a time. Now we're just going through the causally self-reflexive <coughs> character of both the prior intention and the intention in action. Notice, incidentally, that we've already solved two of our paradoxes, uh, two of our puzzle cases. Both the Davidson case and the Chisholm case were cases where the prior intention caused the bodily movement, but there was no intervening intention in action. The guy has stand, is sitting there uh, with his foot on the brake, uh, and his foot slips off the brake, but that, there was no intention in action. The intention in action is always an answer to the question, 
what are you now doing? And there was never a point where the guys, where the answer to the question was, I am now taking my foot off the brake. Uh, no, that's just something that happened. Or what the guy says is, oh my gosh, I seem to have uh, lost control of the car. I've run over a pedestrian. But there's no answer to the question, what are you now doing or what are you now trying to do? That's how you specify the intention and action. Similarly, with the Davidson case of the climber holding another climber, I, the prior intention caused the bodily movement. It went like this. There was a direct cause of the bodily movement, but there was no intervening intention and action. There was no point at which the guy could say, I'm now trying to loosen my hold on the rope, or I'm now loosening my hold on the rope. He just would say, oops, something has happened. So two of the paradoxical cases, we didn't talk about the Bennett case yet, that was a little more complicated. But in these cases, we have the prior intention causing the bodily movement, but there is no point at which the agent can say and answer the question, what are you now doing? I am trying to release my hold on the, uh, my, on the rope. I'm trying to release the brake. That is, there is no intention in action. And that suggests something that I think is right, and we're going to get to that later. Uh, every human action has to contain an intention in action as one of its components. Uh, if it's a successfully performed human action, then the intention in action is satisfied. Not every human uh, intentional human action has to be the result of a prior intention because there are a lot of things you do spontaneously without any plan. Uh, okay, let's now, I want that to sink in and I want to take questions and why don't we collect our sheets of paper now? You know, all that, I mean, I'm sorry to bore you with this, but it gives me an excuse to drink water and think about the rest of the lecture. And while we're, while we're doing all that, if anybody wants to ask a question or make a comment or give me a refutation, you, you like all that? I mean, does that sound plausible to you? Well, okay, um, the, a questioner suggests that the counterexamples don't really demonstrate very much. I, and the point is you have to remember what they're trying to demonstrate. And what they're trying to demonstrate, uh, originally, they were trying to, if you go back to the history of this, um, they, there was a theory that was very influential for a while, uh, that an action is a bodily movement caused by beliefs and desires. And then that proved to be not right, uh, because it, there you can have the beliefs and the desires that cause the action that cause the bodily movement, but it's not an action. Now, there's several things wrong with that whole approach, but one is they left out the role of the intention, the prior intention and the intention and action. But even if you put them in, if you put the prior intention in, the prior intention has to cause the intention and action if it's carried out. You, the, the bodily movement is not enough for an action. There has to be an intention and action. And, and the way that that's ordinary English is always a good clue to this. The way that's marked in ordinary English is there's always an answer to the question, what are you trying to do? Or what are you now doing? And that specifies an intention and action. Now here's the interesting thing. Intentions and action, the ones that philosophers like are things like scratching your head or raising your arm. But you can have a long-term intention and action. What are you doing now? A guy asked me at a party, and I will mumble something, well, I'm trying to write a book on the philosophy of language, and I've been trying to write that book for the past five years or something like that. You can have intention and action that's spread over years and years and years, uh, and you can bore your uh, friends and family with those intentions and action. But an intention and action is an answer to the question, what are you doing now, and what are you trying to do now? And that can be simple, as in the case, I'm, I'm trying to raise my arm, I, um, uh, but another intention and action would be things like, I'm trying to start the revolution, or I'm, I'm uh, trying to write the great American novel. And those are intentions in action, too, and we ought to get to them. I, so I, I, I've got to start somewhere, and I start with the simple cases of these simple bodily movements. But the more complicated cases will be uh, things like uh, doing a complex series of action over a long period of time or doing an action that has a complicated internal structure. See, the structure of the action so far 
ludicrously simple. You're just raising your arm or something like that. We'll get to the complex case in a minute. Okay, other questions about I want everybody to understand this. Candida, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is, all right. Um, she asked the question that I'm going to try to answer in a couple of weeks, but let me just tell you what the question is. I, there is a special problem about human action that makes it different from perception, and that is when you're planning to do something, there is a sense of a gap uh, between the reasons you have for making the decision and the making of the decision uh, or the making of the decision and the onset of the action. Because you feel, I'm doing this, but I could be doing something else. I'm raising my right hand, but I could be raising my left hand. In all of those cases, there's a sense of alternative possibilities open. Now that gap has a name in philosophy. It's called the freedom of the will. And the reason that we have this problem of the freedom of the will is that where, human, where conscious human actions are concerned, we sense a causal gap between the reasons for the formation, you see. So you have reasons here. You have, let's say, belief and desire, and that leads to a prior intention, but there, this is a decision. But there's a gap here. And then, uh, between the prior intention and the onset of the action, there's another gap uh, because, of course, you might change your mind. And then if it's a complicated action, like you're trying to learn French or swim the English Channel uh, or, or, or ski the Haute Oot all over the Alps, there's a gap between the onset and the continuation to completion. And that gap has a name. It's called the freedom of the will, and I'm going to talk about it later, but not today. I can't solve every damn philosophy problem at once, but today we're just going to try to get the structure of actions. But, I, but Candida is right in pointing out there is a problem at the gap. But furthermore, the gap seems to cease when I'm actually trying to do something. However, it doesn't completely cease because with any, a, any action that extends over a period of time, I can always stop halfway through. You know, I decide to raise my arm, but I think, what a boring example. I'll do some other example. I'll get halfway up and then stop. Or you have a gap when you're trying to do some complicated action, like write the great American novel, and you get started on it, uh, but you don't finish. And I have to tell you, uh, uh, the life that I, I lead, academic life, is full of people who started projects that they never actually finished. When I first got to Berkeley, I remember a guy told me with a tone of great awe, he said, most of the scientists who ever lived are alive today. And I said to him, yes, but as far as I can tell, most of the graduate students who've ever been graduate students are still graduate students because there seemed to be no systematic way of encouraging people to finish their uh, PhDs. But in any case, you can take a long time to complete a project uh, and a lot of people start projects that they don't ever actually finish. Okay, I'll say more about that when we talk about freedom of the will. Yeah. They all go on in the brain. Yes. Sorry? The condition of satisfaction, the, again, I'm taking simple examples, but the examples, the, the simplest examples are bodily movements, but they needn't be. Somebody says to me, do the 12 times 12 tables in your head. We, I had to memorize that in the sixth grade. It's about the only thing I learned in, in a school. But I can do the 12. Yeah, I know how much is 11 times 12, all this kind of stuff. I can do it in my head. I can do it without any bodily movement. So not all actions require a bodily movement. I'm just giving you that because it's the simplest case. Also, there are negative actions. I, 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 somebody says to me, sit still. Uh, then that just means don't make any bodily movements. The test for whether or not something is an action is can you tell somebody to do it? And if, and if you have a, uh, an imperative verb, you have an imperative mood of the verb, then that's typically the name of a human action. And you can tell somebody to sit still, and he can form a prior intention, I'm going to sit still, and then his prior intention causes the condition of satisfaction, cause him to sit still. So uh, the, I have given you bodily movements as a simple case, 
Uh, but there are more complex cases, uh, well, not more complex, but just different kind of cases where you have a mental event, which is the condition of satisfaction, and you have cases where a negative, where you perform a negative action, where you don't do something. Now, I said a test for whether or not something is an action is whether or not you can be told to do it. Uh, but that's only a rough test. English and maybe other languages have these weird expressions that always drive me crazy. People say things like, cheer up. What, the, what am I supposed to do? I say, okay, cheer up. Uh, how do I do it? I mean, I don't know how to do that. Uh, and I think that doesn't, that doesn't mean perform the intentional action of cheering up. What are you now doing? I'm cheering up. No, that sounds fishy. But I think it means something like look at the bright side. Uh, things aren't so bad. There are things you can do to cheer up. So there are, uh, there are cases of verbs that take the imperative mood, like be honest, cheer up. I, which don't name actions, but you can usually interpret them in a way that you get an action out of it. Yes? Yeah. Okay. The prior intention caused the bodily movement by way of causing nervousness, but that's all right. I mean, we, we want something like the transitivity of... Uh, uh, causation. So if A causes B and B causes C, then A is causally responsible for C. You see, in the case where I'm actually carrying it out, the prior intention doesn't just cause me uh, to shoot the gun, but it causes me to shoot the gun by way of squeezing the trigger. Uh, but all the same, it did cause the shooting of the gun. Yes? No, the nervousness was not, nervousness is not the name of an intentional action. What are you doing now? I'm nervousing. No, that's not a, I, 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 um, being nervous is not the an, uh, name of an answer to the question. But the, the intention causes an agitation, and the agitation causes the bodily movement. But the intention is causally responsible for the bodily movement. If you hadn't had that intention, you wouldn't have had the bodily movement because you wouldn't have been nervous. So I agree uh, that you have these intermediate causes. But that's true even when things are going according to plan. You intended to shoot the gun, uh, but in order to shoot the gun, you had to squeeze the trigger. Uh, but all the same, you can say the intention caused you to shoot the gun. The intention caused the shooting of the gun, even though it did it by way of causing the pulling of the trigger. Now, I'm going to say more about all this stuff when we get into the complex structure of action. We haven't got to the complex structure yet. I'm still doing simple actions. Okay, yes, over here is a question. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, remember, I gave you the example uh, from uh, Penfield uh, where uh, the guy's motor electrode stimulates his brain, and that's the case where you had the bodily movement but no intention in action. That's the case where the guy says, I didn't do that, you did it. So there can be body, now, of course, there are other cases like the peristaltic contraction of the gut. That's less interesting. But if the guy raises his arm, that's normally intentional action. But you can get him to raise his arm by stimulating the motor cortex. Now, what's interesting is at which point can you come in and stimulate the uh, motor cortex? In the case that I know of, that's the a Penfield case, you stimulate the motor cortex and it produces the bodily movement. That's a case where the guy says, my arm is going up, but I am not raising it. You're doing that. But how about this? Could you come in here and stimulate the intention and action? See, this case, the guy says, I didn't do that, you did it. Uh, I didn't raise my arm, you raised it. But how about the guy who says, for some damn fool reason, I don't know why, I'm raising my arm. That would be a case where you stimulated the brain Produce, to produce the intention and action. Nobody has done that. And how about stimulating it here at the prior intention? That would be the case where the guy says, for some reason, I don't know why, I've just made up my mind to raise my arm. Did you see that? That is, the, the guy has the prior intention by stimulating his brain. Nobody's been able to do that. And I guess, and I think the reason is, this stuff is fairly localized in the motor cortex. The bodily movement will be localized so you can stimulate a specific point and cause a specific bodily movement. 
But here, intentions and actions and prior intentions, uh, they're much less localized. I mean, they involve uh, uh, big chunks of the brain, and nobody knows how to stimulate the brain uh, to produce an intention action or a bodily movement. You want to say some more? Because that's it. Uh, Yeah. The neurons firing simultaneously cause the intention action and the bodily movement. Yes. It didn't make sense how it could only cause the bodily movement. But yeah. They, they, no. The cases are that what happens in the in the Penfield case is that you have the neurons stimulate the bo- uh, the the cause the bodily movement, but there is no intention and action. There's no point in the Penfield case where the guy says and answer the question, "What are you now doing, or what are you trying to do?" where he says, I'm trying to raise my arm. What he says is, for some reason, I re- my arm has gone up, but I didn't raise it. You did it by that stuff you're doing inside my brain. Yeah. Do you make a distinction between unaction and action? An, a non-action? Oh, no, no, like unaction, like a, a sing- an action, a singular action, a and action. Oh, an action. And, uh, action. and a type of action, or sure. Just unaction and action itself. Well, I make a distinction between action types and action tokens. That is, I keep giving you these examples of raising my arm. That's a type of action. But what we're interested in is actually existing tokens. And what I'm saying is an actually existing token has to have two components. It has to have the intention and action and the bodily movement, where the intention and action causes the bodily movement. Now, action types are going to be crucial for our uh, discussion. Because, of course, uh, when you have an intention to do something, there isn't any token. You haven't done it yet. Uh, There's only the type of action that you're hoping to produce. So the intentional content doesn't make reference to a specifically existing action, but only to a type of thing which the specifically existing action will exemplify. Okay, I now want to move to complex cases. And following uh, this great philosophical tradition, I will pick a murderous and homicidal example. Um, And I'll take a historical case because we know something about the case. Uh, You remember the First World War was started uh, when a group of, well, essentially student radicals uh, in the city of Sarajevo assassinated uh, the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. Uh, They were driving around. uh, There was an official state visit they had to Sarajevo, and they were driving around uh, in uh, this uh, uh, fancy open car, uh, this open touring uh, car in Sarajevo. And these um, uh, bewildered student radicals were pretty confused, and they lost track of where they were supposed to uh, meet up with the Archduke, where they were supposed to encounter him. So one of them, named Gavrilo Princip, was going home disconsolately with his heavily loaded gun. His name is Princip, first name Gavrilo. Gavrilo Princip was going home with his huge uh, revolver. Uh, And in the meantime, the driver of the Archduke's car got lost in the back streets. And he was in a side street, and he stopped and backed into a driveway to try to turn the car around. And at that moment, to his total amazement, Gavrilo found himself directly opposite the Archduke and his morganatic wife. So Gavrilo takes out his gun and blasts away, thus changing the course of European history. Now, we imagine we're asking Gavrilo, what on earth are you trying to do? We're interested in knowing what are your intentions in action. And it seems to me he might say at least the following. He might say, I'm pulling the trigger. Now, even that implies that he's a fairly amateurish assassin, uh, because an experienced assassin never thinks about the trigger. He just thinks, I'm going to get the guy in the head or something like that. He pulls the trigger, he's pulling the trigger, he's firing the gun, he's killing, well, let's say, let's put in all the steps. He doesn't just kill him instantly, but he shoots him. He's shooting the Archduke, shooting the Archduke, 
killing the Archduke. But why is he doing that? Well, in the course of all of this, there is something, there's another description of what he's doing. He is striking a blow against Austria. He's striking a blow against the Austro-Hungarian Empire, against the dual empire. And why is he doing that? He is avenging Serbia. Okay, now notice all of those are true descriptions that we can give of Gavrilo's action. He pulled the trigger, fired the gun, shot the Archduke, killed the Archduke, struck a blow against Austria, and avenged Serbia. But notice that there are not two, four, six actions that he performed. There's only one action that he performed that has these different levels of description. Furthermore, all of those are part of the content of his intention in action. What are you now doing, we say to Gavrilo, and it seems to me he can answer with any of these. He can say, I'm shooting the Archduke, I'm striking a blow against Austria, uh, I'm avenging Serbia, I'm pulling the trigger. All of those will be true descriptions, but they're systematically related to each other. And this is a very important point about human action. There are two types of relationships. There's a causal relationship where pulling the trigger causes the gun to fire. Firing the gun causes the Archduke to be shot. Shooting the Archduke causes the death of the Archduke and so on. But here at this point there's a break because killing the Archduke doesn't cause a blow to be struck against Austria. It just is. It constitutes striking a blow against Austria. So there's, in, in ordinary English, we'd say, well, you did something by means of doing something else. You pulled the trigger, uh, you fired the gun by means of pulling the trigger. But there are two types of these relationships. There's a causal by means of relation. You fired the gun by means of pulling the trigger. You shot the archduke by means of firing the gun. But there's also a constitutive relation where killing the archduke just constitutes striking a blow and I'm going to distinguish between what I will call the causal by means of relation and the constitutive by way of. You do something by way of doing something else. The constitutive by way of relation. So you struck a blow against Austria by way of assassinating, by way of killing uh, the archduke. Now, I think those are the only two ways uh, to do complex human actions. You can, uh, the, the chairman of the meeting says, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Now, I raise my hand, and my intention action causes my arm to go up. But my raising my hand doesn't cause me to vote. It just is voting. Does everybody see that? It constitutes voting. Uh, when I make noises through my mouth, it doesn't cause me uh, uh, to, um, uh, the, the, the noises that are made don't cause me to perform a speech act, they just are a speech act. The intention causes the performance of the speech act, but the noises are, they constitute the speech act. Okay, so we get this complex structure. Now there's some jargon I want you uh, to understand, because we're now talking about the inner structure of human action. And that is the, this effect whereby you can expand or contract the description of the action is called the accordion effect. The idea being that you can expand the accordion or contract the accordion. I, and that jargon of the accordion effect, that terminology is due to Al Goldman. Um, he invented that terminology, the accordion effect. And a lot of philosophers will tell you the accordion can go on indefinitely. That's wrong insofar as you're talking about the accordion of human action, that is the description of human action, the boundaries of the accordion are set by the boundaries of the intention in action. Notice, there's a whole lot of stuff that went on down here, below avenging Serbia, that's not part 
of uh, the uh, intentional action. So, for example, Gavrilo started the First World War, or at least on, uh, uh, one, on one interpretation of what happened. There are all kinds of other side effects that his action had, but they're not parts of the structure of his action. Uh, so, for example, uh, he made uh, the emperor of Germany, uh, Wilhelm II, he made him very angry, so angry that he wanted to mobilize. But if you ask him, what are you trying to do, he won't say, I'm angering William II, or I'm really trying to get that guy upset. No, he's not trying to do that. Uh, here on the side, uh, he had a lot of side effects. He made bullet holes in the upholstery of the car. But he said, world history is different. If we imagine, we say to Gavrilo, what are you trying to do? And he said, I'm trying to make a pattern in the upholstery with the bullet holes, uh, and these damn people keep getting in the way. No, then that's a different story altogether. If you're ever in Vienna, you should go look at the car. It's a fantastic uh, 1914 uh, touring sedan, and it's got the bullet holes in the upholstery. It's in a museum in, in uh, uh, of Vienna, but that's not part of the accordion of the complex intention and action. That's just sup something that happened. Uh, up here, above pulling a trigger, uh, we could say he caused neuron firings in his brain. But if we ask him, what are you doing? He can't say, oh, I'm busy causing neuron firings in my brain. Uh, he can't, even if he's a medical student, he wouldn't say, I'm secreting acetylcholine at the axon end plates of my motor neurons, though he is doing that because that's not part of what he's trying to do. That's just something uh, that happens. So you have events that occur here above, events that are off to the side, and events down here below. They are not part of the accordion of intentional action. Furthermore, there is something that you do without doing anything else by means of which or by way of which you do it. In this case, we suppose it's just pulling the trigger. And a guy who introduced a term for that, it's called a basic action. Or a basic action, that was due to Arthur Dento. A basic action is an action that you can perform without intending to do anything else by way of which or means of, by means of which you do it. You just pull the trigger. Now, I like that notion because what's basic for one person will not be basic for another. It's relative to your background abilities. Uh, I am not a very good typist, so I have to do kind of one finger or two finger things. But a really good typist, uh, the kind of people that work for me, just, it just sort of flows for her. I mean, she, she's like a pianist, or for that matter, a pianist can play a whole arpeggio without having to have separate intentions for the different components. I have a problem finding middle C. It's one of the white jobs next to three black jobs. I can find it uh, with, uh, uh, with some help. Uh, but uh, it's not, I'm not good at that kind of stuff. So what is basic for one person will not be basic for another. I'm assuming that ba Gavrilo is not an experienced gunman, and he has to think, pull the trigger. But a really experienced gunman might just think, kill the guy. I, I just I kill him, and that would be a basic action. What is basic is a function of skill. How skilled can you get? What would what, what like would it be, of course, that you could just get to the point where if you ask, what are you doing? You just say, flourishing. And what do I do? I have the intention to flourish, so I flourish. It's just a basic action. I don't know anybody that skillful. You have to do something by means of which or by way of which you flourish. OK, let me just summarize what I've been saying, because we've made some real progress today. We're getting at the structure of human action. We've made a distinction between the prior intention and the intention action. They're both causally self-reflexive. The causal self-reflexivity in complex cases has two sorts of complexity. It has the complexity of the causal relation, where you cause something to happen by means of causing something else to happen. You cause the gun to fire by means of pulling the trigger. But they're also the constitutive by way of relations. When you vote for the motion by raising your arm, your raising of the arm doesn't cause you to vote for the motion. It just constitutes voting for the motion. Those are the two ways that we have of structuring human behavior in the complex forms. Now, it gets more complicated when we get to collective intentionality. 
the capacity that you have to cooperate with other people, and those create constant, uh, complex forms where you have both causal relations, that's when you're playing on a football team, but they also have constitutive relations. So when you cross the goal line in possession of the ball, uh, while a play is in progress, that doesn't cause you to score a touchdown, it just constitutes scoring a touchdown. Human civilization is created by repeated applications of these simple maneuvers, and I'm going to teach you in some detail how it works. Okay, we'll go on with this next time.